All right, if you would please take your Bibles this evening and turn to Psalm 116. This will be the last time that I preach this week, and I want to say that uh, we are thankful to the church for your hospitality, for your friendship, for your faithfulness to the Lord in a somewhat barren land, and yet you're faithful to the Lord. We appreciate that. I don't say this lightly, but uh, I, I do not want to preach tonight's message. I don't want to. And I'm not trying to be rebellious to the Lord, but I prefer to preach when I feel like it's easy to live what I'm going to have to say. And don't take this the wrong way, but you think what Brother Crotz had to say was bad. You... Um, you should leave now. I mean that. I mean that. Let's begin by reading verse number 1. The Bible says in Psalm 116, verse number 1, I love the Lord because He hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because He hath inclined His ear unto me, therefore will I call upon Him as long as I live. That's going to become a theme right here. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Now, let me say this, and I'm trying to, guys, I'm working really hard tonight to say the right words. Everything that the Bible says is recorded 100% accurately. But not everything in the Bible is true. And somebody's going to walk out of here tonight and say, well, that preacher, you know, it's a Bible conference. He said everything in the Bible is not true. But the Bible tells us and records that Satan said, thou shalt not surely die. But that was a lie. The Bible accurately records what he said. But what he said is not true. The Lord often in the book of Psalms will record a man's emotions, his perceptions, his feelings, his thoughts even though those may or may not be accurate from God's pers perspective. Let me put it to you this way, okay? Let me try to say this a different way because I, I want, I mean, it's so important to me. I promise you it's so important that I say the right thing the right way, God's way. Sometimes the way I feel about my trials and troubles may be true to me, but it's not true. Sometimes the way you feel about things in life, they are, everybody uses, they're your truth, but they're not true. I don't know whether the psalmist is really near death or whether he's like me. Guys, I get a cold. I, I got COVID, okay? I got COVID. And uh, the worst thing that happened to me, I got dehydrated. And this was when we were uh, live streaming services, and I was supposed to be over in my desk ready to preach, and I was dehydrated. My wife, I kid you not, she's got Gatorade over there holding it. I'm, I'm on the bed. I can't roll out of the bed. I got 20 minutes to get over to the office chair to preach, okay? I, I don't know if we pulled that. We need to check and see if we pulled. We should have pulled that sermon. That was a train wreck from the get-go. I was an emotional basket case. I started cramping. I, I was having muscle cramps, back I was I was a train wreck, okay? And uh, my wife's got Gatorade over here. I can't roll over to drink it, so we got a straw. I'm trying my best to, you know, get some, uh, some electrolytes or whatever that stuff is in me. And I said, honey, I said, do you have one of those things, you know, that you roll over cookies or whatever? She said, what was it, a rolling pin? Is that what it's called? I don't know. She said, a rolling pin? I said, go get it. Because I've seen enough sports. You know, they're sitting over there rolling stuff on guys. I don't care whether this is medical or not. And I said, go get that thing. And she's over there rolling my back. And, and I'm, I mean, I'm crying. Guys, I got I to get over there. I mean, it's now like 15 minutes. I can't even put a dress shirt on. You know, I'm trying. You know what I'm talking about. Those of you that are young are like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> you wait. One of these days, just rolling over in the bed in the middle of the night, you're going to wake up in the morning and say, man, something went crazy last night. I got in a fight. It was a pillow. A pillow attacked me, and I threw something out. But, I mean, I was in a bad way, and I'm crying. I'm and you know what I thought? I'm dying. I'm dying. 
I get you get the flu. I do believe in the man flu. I don't know whether you all believe in it or not, but I believe in the man flu. And when I get the man flu, guys, it's, it's worse than the woman flu. Okay, the, yeah, yeah. the woman flu still allows you to take care of the children, cook meals, clean the house. But man, the man flu, you, if y'all ever got that, I'm telling you, you would know what I'm talking about. That thing will kill you in a heartbeat. And I've had the man flu, and I thought, man, I'm going to, I mean, this is it. I'm going to die. And I think sometimes what we're reading in the book of Psalms, we laugh, but I think sometimes you're reading a, a man's perception of the events and not necessarily how it was from God's perspective, okay? And that's going to be important in just a minute. I'm glad we can laugh in church. Aren't you glad we can laugh in church? I'm not trying to mock the Lord. I'm certainly not trying to be irreverent to His Word. But God records man's perspective of the events. And so He says in verse number 3, The psalmist, whoever it may be, the sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. In other words, Lord, I'm going to die, and I need you to keep me alive. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return to thy rest, O my soul. In other words, when he got close to death, his soul got in a bad, bad place. There was no rest. It's, it's like, Lord, I need you to do something right now because I'm about to die, and if I die, it's going to be bad. Right? I told you, I don't want to preach this because what you're reading right now, that's me. I mean, that's me right there. That's the way I'd, if I went to the doctor this week, I promise you, if I went to the doctor and the doctor said, uh, sir, you have cancer, I'd fall apart. I would. I'd want everybody begging God that I would live. That's what you'd do. Come on. So you're saying, yeah, that's bad, preacher. Come on. That's exactly what you would do. Prayer chains would not exist if it weren't for this kind of thing right here. Such and such is 112 years old, and they got sick. Pray that they live. No, good night, guys. <laughs> At some point, something's going to have to take you. You understand what I'm saying? There was a guy, I can't remember how old he was. He, he, he survived COVID. He, was, he had been through this war and that war, and he survived COVID. I, and, and everybody's, isn't this great? I'm like, that guy is probably wondering, what is it going to take to get me out of here but it's all about your perspective it really is verse 7 return to thy rest O my soul for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee in other words the Lord was so good to me because he kept me alive verse number 8 for thou hast delivered my soul from death you see that's what he's saying the Lord's so good because he kept me alive well what would the Lord have been if he hadn't He'd have just been okay. Guys, I, I got to tell you, we get saved, but we basically live much of our lives like practical atheists. And we are the worst when it comes to death. Now, what I'm saying, I don't want to shock you. I don't... I don't want that. If, if Brother Summers would have called me, I'd have said, no, that, you know, I'll pass. You give that to somebody else, I'll let them take that. I don't want to say tonight what I'm saying to you, but I believe with all my heart what I'm saying to you tonight is accurate. It's true. I'm just telling you I'm having a hard time with it because I, I struggle to live what I'm preaching to you. We get on to the charismatics. Because the charismatics basically say, if a trial comes into your life, you, you should go to God and ask him what you need to repent of in order to get the trial to go away because God wouldn't send you through a trial because it's never his will to send you through a heartache or a difficulty. It's never God's will for you to have cancer. And if you've got cancer, it's because you sinned somewhere along the way. And if you'd repent of that sin, God would take the cancer and you'd be well. And we say, oh, those people are heathenistic. How, could, how dare they teach that kind of stuff to our people? But that's exactly the way we view death. 
He says in verse number 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. In other words, I was crying, but you did something where I don't have to cry anymore. You're so good. Verse number 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I mean, you, you see how much focus he has on life? I get to live. I get to live. God's so good, I get to live. That's his perspective. And by the way, it's my perspective. And it's probably your perspective. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? I mean, the Lord's been so good to me because he kept me alive. What do I owe him? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows, which makes me think when he was on the verge of death or at least felt like he was on the verge of death, Lord, if you'll let me live, I promise you I will do this and I will do this and I'll, I'll never do that again and I'll start doing that. Lord, if you'll just let me live, here's what all I'm gonna do for you. And now he lives, and he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep my word on all that, Lord, because you are such a good God, because you let me live. Let's get down to verse 16, would you? And you say, well, verse 15. I know, we'll be there in a minute. Verse 16, O oh Lord, truly, I, I am thy servant. I, see, I want to say that in most aspects of life. But I got to be honest, in this whole death thing, a servant is somebody that perfectly obeys the will of a master. I don't know that in death I can say, Oh Lord, truly I am thy servant. Because I have a plan on how this is going to go down for me. My first choice, plan A, is the rapture of the church. Plan A. Way, way down the list is plan B. And plan B is I feel no sickness. I feel no sadness. I feel no pain. I, I don't have a disease. I don't get sick with this or with that. No doctor ever puts a needle in my arm to check anything or test anything. There's no blood pressure taken. I go to sleep one night and I don't wake up. That's plan B. And plan B, I promise you, is way down the list from plan A. Plan A, rapture, boom. <laughs> That's the way I want to do this. That doesn't sound like a guy who's the Lord's servant. You hear me? I've got ways I don't want to go. Like I've got ways I want to, if, if, if we have to do this, we've got to do plan B or plan C or something. Okay, that'll be fine, I guess, maybe, possibly. But at least let's not do this, 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 and this. I don't want to drown. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to drown. Okay, I don't want to burn up. I mean, I've got ways I don't want this to happen. Guys, that is not the attitude of a servant. That is the attitude of a master. That's me telling God, this is how we need to do this. By the way, the psalmist is telling God how grateful he is because God let him live and not die because dying must be horrible and living must be great. Now, listen, I want to be very careful here tonight. If you have thought, and I mean this, I mean this. If you have thoughts of committing suicide and you think what I'm going to say tonight is going to back up your thoughts, you're wrong. Because you, when you commit suicide, you become the master and you tell God, I'm going to do it on my terms. It's not up to you when it happens. Does everybody understand that? Because I'm going to talk to you tonight about how good death is in comparison to life and I can just see the devil right now working in somebody's heart and mind they walk out of here and they say well see I, I want to check out of here and what he said verify no I'm not verifying or confirming your thoughts you're going to have to stand before God after you commit suicide now let's read on down verse number 16 O Lord truly I am thy servant I am thy servant and the son of thy handmaid and thou hast loosed my bonds in other words by keeping me alive I was in bondage 
because I thought I was going to die, but you broke those bonds and now I'm alive. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of, his pe- of all his people. In other words, I-, I get to live and be with people and I'm going to praise God in front of all those people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O oh, Jerusalem, I get to live in Jerusalem. This is so great. I get to live in Jerusalem some more. Praise ye the Lord. Now, I've struggled. I, I, I read one commentary on this, which is all, almost always a mistake, but it is entertaining. I promise reading a commentary is good entertainment. And they said in verse number 15, the word precious doesn't really mean like precious. And when it gets down to the last part of verse number 15 where it says the death, it's really not meaning like the death. What it really means is it's talking about like the Lord working in your life and keeping you alive. I'm like, that's kind of weird. Because when I read that, that's like the opposite of what I get but I know why we do that because we don't want to face that we don't really believe like God in verse number 15 isn't that bad we can't expect the people in the world to believe like God if we won't man most people most believers let's be honest we die like atheists We die like there's nothing good on the other side of death. We panic. You say, well, I don't know what's there. Guys, I've lived a lot of life. I don't know what's what's coming tomorrow. But I don't panic about tomorrow like I would panic about death. Now, let me... I've got a lot of things written here. Let me just mention this. Do you remember? I hope you you remember the story because I don't really have the time to go deal with it and go verse by verse. But do you remember Hezekiah in the Bible when the Lord basically sent Isaiah to say, hey, buddy, you're dead. Hezekiah did what this guy right here would have done. He immediately begged God that it wouldn't happen. And God answered the prayer. But that was the worst possible thing for Hezekiah. Can you believe I'm going to say this in a Baptist church? The best thing Hezekiah could have done was just died. Go read your Bible right there in the same chapter. The Lord gave him 15 more years. You know what he does immediately? Because God was so good to keep me alive. Look at these Babylonians coming. These guys are great. You guys want to see the stuff we've got here in Israel? Sure. What do you want to see? You want to see our weapons? You want to see our gold? You want to see our top secret stuff? Guys, God's so good, he kept me alive. Let me just show you everything. And he takes them in there and he shows them all this stuff. And Isaiah comes back and said, buddy, what did you do? He said, well, the Babylonians came because they were so impressed. God kept me alive. They want to see the stuff. Well, what did you show them? Everything. Isaiah or Hezekiah, those people are going to come back and take our people captive. You know what would have been the best thing for him to do? When the Lord said, your time's up, the best thing for Hezekiah to have done would have been said, yes, sir. Guys, you see how dangerous this is? I mean, this, you put me on the spot, brother. I don't know why you did this to me. I have loved you. And you <laughs> All you give me in return is a message like this. Can I just point out a couple things in Psalm 116? Verse number 15, we've already defined the word precious. The word precious is valuable or great worth or price. It can exist because of personal appreciation or value or because it's rare or it's minimal in its availability. But I need you to notice this in verse number 15. It says in verse 15, precious, but then look at that next phrase. In the sight, what does it say? Of the Lord. So we've been reading in Psalm 116 in the sight of a psalmist. We've read how he views it. 
Death, terrible. Life, great. Heaven, bad. Jerusalem, wonderful. Right? Death, not so praiseworthy. Life, extremely praiseworthy. We've got his perspective. But it's almost as though the Lord said, you know what? I'm not going to let this psalm go by without sticking in there. The man and myself have a little bit of a different viewpoint on this. Man sees it this way, but I see it a bit different. And so he says in verse number 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I've got, and this is going to scare you at first, but don't let it scare you, okay? I've got 17 points to tonight's message. But they won't go like normal preacher points, okay? They're going to go fairly quick. I'm not going to turn to all the verses. If you need the verses, you can see me after service, and I'll gladly provide you with the Bible verses. But I would like to spend the next few minutes showing you the difference between the way man views death and the way God views death. Can we do that? In the sight of man, death is a result of the fall. Right? If it wasn't for the fall, we wouldn't die. But in the sight of God, death is our deliverance from the fall. See why God sees it a little different than I do? Say, well, see, this wouldn't happen if we hadn't Adam and Eve in the garden. It would have been so much better. God says, you don't understand. The fall doesn't touch you anymore. It's just different perspective. Man sees death as the end of life. God sees death as the beginning of true and eternal life. We have eternal life, but you step into eternal life when you die. Man sees death as the giving up of the soul and the spirit. Oh, there, the soul's in departing. The, the, gave up the ghost there it is that's death the spirit and the soul are gone but God sees death as the reception of the soul and the spirit man sees death as the time when he is separated from his treasures oh can I have to leave behind that house and that car all that stuff God sees our death as the time we enter into our greatest treasures Man sees death as, as the time he's ensnared. Man, I, the snares of death. But God sees death as the time when we are freed from the snares of our flesh. We see death as the time when we are robbed from whatever beauty we have remaining. Isn't that true? People say, oh, that, they were so beautiful in, in their youth and I think, well, there's, it's a fading flower. There goes that beauty. But God sees death as the time when we take on the likeness of the most beautiful Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never be more beautiful than you will when you pass through death. We see death as a time when our praise ceases. But death is really the time when our truest and purest praise begins. We see death as the time when our hope ceases. Well, there it is. It's gone. All hope's gone. But God sees our death as the time when hope gives way to reality. <laughs> Man, that's good. That's good. We see death as the dissolving of this tabernacle. But God sees our death as the time of the putting on of an eternal house. We see death as a time of the great unknown, but God sees it as the time of the great known. His son has passed through it, tasted it for all men. It's not unknown to God. We see death as a time of great pain, but God sees death as a time when pain ends. We see death as a time of defeat. Well, did you hear about old sister such and such? She, she lost her battle with cancer. 
Now, how do we say it? She lost her battle. She got defeated. Cancer took another one. God sees death as a time of great victory. We need to stop talking like that. We need to stop saying they lost their battle with cancer. We need to start saying they won their battle over cancer. Because that's how it happens. I mean, if you're saved, that's the reality. We say, well, it's death is a time of corruption. Remember Mary and Martha. Well, he, he stinketh by now. I mean, don't you know, Lord, that body's corrupted. But the Lord sees death as a time when corruption puts on incorruption. We see death as a time to be feared and avoided. God sees death for us as a time that ought to be desired and longed for. Do you remember the Apostle Paul said to be with Christ, which is, what did he say? Far better. I'm not trying to nitpick, but that last song we sang, I can't remember one of the verses was, even talking about death like it was a horrible thing. Guys, why do we think like that? Do you understand? Come on, do you believe the Bible? Death is, I mean, the Bible talks about for us, death is like falling asleep. That's all it is. You're just, you're asleep. I awake with thy likeness. Wow, you've got to be kidding me. I never thought it would. I mean, I couldn't even fathom how great this was going to be. And can you imagine this? Or, oh, Lord, don't let me die. Please, Lord, don't let me. Whatever you do, don't let me die. And the Lord says, what are you doing? Do you not understand what happens just on the other side of that veil? When lost people hear us talk about death, you have to understand we are discouraging them from trusting Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? We talk about death like it is some horrific thing that, oh goodness, we're going to die. We're gonna... That's the way the lost man talks. You know what a saved person should I'm not asking you to say, Lord, kill me tonight. Okay? But if the Lord appoints you a time tonight, raise your hands toward heaven and say, Lord, I'm coming. I'm trying to be careful because I, I, I understand what I'm talking to you about tonight is an emotional, an emotional subject. But how much money do we pour into keeping ourselves alive? You will spend more money on keeping yourself alive than you'll spend on anything else in this world. You will be willing to try stuff you would never in your life try. They say, hey, uh, we, I, I don't want to get in the vaccination stuff and all that stuff. But, but you, you say, hey, we've got this new drug. We never tried it out on anybody. Would you like to try it? Well, if it'll keep me alive. Well, now you may grow horns, okay? You may grow horns. Uh, you may get a, a third arm. We don't, we're not real sure how this is going to work. Well, but if it'll keep me alive. It's true. Because I just don't want to die, okay? You got it? I just don't want to die. So you'd rather live with three arms than to die. You got it. You got it. Obviously, us and God are not on the same page in this particular subject matter. We see death as a time of mourning. But God sees death as the time when mourning truly ceases. There's no more mourning. We see death as a, as a time of separation from loved ones. But do you realize that death is actually the time when you are united with the loved one? We see death as the time when our service to God ends. But God sees it as the time when our best service begins. We're just messed up. We really are. And by the way, next week, I'll mess up on this. I promise you. Somebody will say, hey, did you hear such and such is on their deathbed? And I'll start begging God immediately. Oh, God, don't you dare let them. 
Should we pray in accordance with God's will? Should we? Now, guys, come on. Buckle your seatbelt for just a second, okay? Would you be willing to pray God's will if it meant somebody lost their life? That's tough, isn't it? See, I don't want to do this. I don't want to even, I'd rather preach about, man, precious promises and precious blood. And I want all those sermons, guys. This is not one I want because I know most of us don't believe right on this. And we certainly don't practice right on this. Death is not a bad thing for a Christian. I wish I could spend time telling you stories of martyrs who went to the stake for their faith. There was one man. I don't remember the man's name in particular. Specifically, you may remember the story and you may remember his name. But he was being led to the to the stake, and they were gonna. They had the wood set up at the bottom of the stake, and 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 they were gonna light the fire. And lighting the fire, they were gonna they were gonna light him. Okay. Along the way, I think this was on the passageway to get to the place of execution. Some of the saints said, "How will you let us know that the grace of God?" was sufficient in death. And he told those people, he said, if I clap my hands, or if I, something along those lines, if I clap my hands, then that lets you know that the grace of God that worked in my life, it worked in my death. And if I, if I remember the story correctly, the flames of fire had so much began to touch this man's body that uh, some of the things holding him were burned off and and he to let all the saints of God know and that the God that was with me in my life is with me in my death we don't view death that way we don't view it that way and we're pro- I'm probably not going to convince you tonight because you and I are emotional creatures that get caught up in the emotion and how we feel about something and how we view something and we forget. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It matters what God thinks. And God said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his son. That's what he said. So who's right? Me and you? Or God? Who's right? Come on. God's right. (laughs) And we say that, we think, well, yeah, but I've got pretty good points. Right? (laughs) I know God's right, but you don't understand my circumstances. I'm I'm not trying to challenge your circumstances. I'm trying to tell you if somebody's saved, death is better than life. That's a foundation of what we say we believe. Come on, is this the best it's going to be or is it going to be better after? After. You believe that? Go to Psalm 73 with me, if you will. I'm going to give you a couple verses. I don't, I don't anticipate being much longer, but I want to be very careful how I say that because we preachers have a tendency to say that and then not do so well. But he says this in Psalm 73. This is a psalm of Asaph. And he said this in verse 3. I w- for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Look down to verse number 10. Therefore his people uh, return hither. At, uh, that's not the verse that I want. Let, let me re- read on down. Uh, psalm 73 verse number 3. For I was envious uh, at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death but their strength is firm. In other words he said man they die so easy. They're not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. You believe that to some degree. I mean, you look at people and say, well, why are they getting away with stuff? They're not even saved, and they're wicked, and the Lord's letting them get away with stuff. I mean, right? You've seen a saved person die really a horrible death, and you've seen a lost person die just as easy as can be. And you say, well, that's not fair. 
Verse number six, therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment, their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than heart could wish. I mean, they've got so much stuff. They are corrupt, they speak wickedly, concerning oppression, they speak loftily, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, as people turn hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them, and they say, how doth God know? And he's just fussing, he's just saying, you know, I'm so envious of those people, it's just terrible how easy they got it and how bad we've got it but then look what he said here in verse 14 he said for all the day long have i been plagued and chastened every morning in other words life's really rough for me it's not so bad for those guys if i should say i will speak thus behold i should offend against the generation of thy children when i thought to know this it was too painful for me i just couldn't even dwell on it but look at verse 17 until i went into the sanctuary of god in other words, I was really envious of those rich people. They're living at ease. I mean, they got boats, and I mean, they're just living on the they're living on the lake. Man, they've got it so good. They don't get sick. We get sick. They stay healthy. We die. They live. When we when they do die, it's real easy, and we got it rough, and it's just really bad for us and really good for them. And the Lord's got to be thinking the whole time, Asaph, buddy, what are you? What's wrong with you? Why don't you come down to the sanctuary? Let's have a little talk. Hey, Seth, buddy, what happens to you after you die? Well, Lord, I'll be in your uh, presence. Now, we understand Abraham's bosom at the time, okay? I'm not, I'm not trying to get doctrinally into all where, the, you know, the heart of the earth versus heaven, but I'll be with your people. Well, Asaph, what happens to them? Oh, well, they go to hell. Okay, Asaph, hold on, buddy. So what you're telling me is, for a little space of time on this side of death, you might suffer and they might not. That's right, Lord. It's not fair. Okay, but Asaph, buddy, listen to me. The moment you die, you are in peace with my people. The moment they die, they are in the torments of hell. I get it. I get it. Death is merely a little tunnel that we go through to step into a blessed eternity. But death is a horrible, horrible tunnel that they pass through to suffer forever. Lord, I'm sorry. Look what he says. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so Lord, when, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved. I was pricked in my, what was I thinking? Boy, I was a fool. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by my right hand. In other words, Lord, you're the, you're the God. You're the Savior that walks through that valley of the shadow of death with me. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory listen death is not to be feared you're not to bring it upon yourself but friend it is a passageway to get to God so God says it is precious look at numbers chapter 23 real quick got just maybe three more bible verses for you numbers chapter 23 and verse number 10 This is Balaam. I, I'm, I don't have time to go into all the context and tell you good things, bad things about Balaam. He was, a, he was a strange duck. Let's just say it that way. God used him, but he was a mess. I mean, he was an absolute mess. But I want you to see this in verse number 10. This is Balaam, and he says, Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? Look what he says. Look, you see it right there, that last phrase? Let me, Balaam, a wicked man, let's be honest, let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. That's what the world should be saying about the church. That's what the world should be saying 
about the Christians. Boy, I sure wish my death could be like that death. I sure wish my end was like that person's end. Look with me, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And can I just say this? Everything that I've said tonight concerning the blessings of death has nothing to do with lost people. So if you're sitting here tonight and you're lost, you're like, oh, well, that's not that bad. No, it's horrible for you. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Lord's not saying that it's precious when a lost man dies and goes to hell. He's saying it's precious when a saint dies and comes to him. It's a big difference there. Proverbs chapter 14, verse number 32. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness. Look at this. Isn't this amazing? But the righteous hath hope in his death. Isaiah chapter 57. Can I just say this to you? First Thessalonians, you know, the Bible says we're not to sorrow as others which have no hope. The Bible doesn't say you can't sorrow. It just says don't sorrow like they sorrow. The world has a reason to, to sorrow and to stay in sorrow because that's it. I've had people say, well, you know, we're going to be re reunited in hell. I don't know. I've, this is the first time I've ever seen this. This week we were out somewhere and uh, there was a car in front of us. And, you know, these people put weird things on their cars in memory of other people. It gets really creepy when you start dedicating your car to somebody. I just want, well, even if it was a NASCAR driver or something, I mean, it's just creepy stuff. But it had like several names and it said, uh, I kid you not, it said, give heaven some hell. And I thought, what in the, that's the first time I've ever seen that. Some special up here in Michigan. I said, what in the, what in the world are they thinking? And my wife and I are trying to, what does that even mean? And I guess it means these bad people died and they're in heaven because everybody, I guess, goes to heaven when they die. And they're going to shake heaven up and make it more like hell. That's what these people, I mean, you've got to be a, an idiot to put that on your car. You've got to be an idiot to believe it, but you've got to be like a special kind of an idiot to put it on your car. Let's be honest. We've all had thoughts that were stupid. But when you take that thought and you go to some company and say, hey, could you print this out? I'm going to put that on my car. You're a special level of idiot. <laughs> Give heaven some hell? I'm going to tell you, there's not going to be an ounce of hell in heaven. And uh, every lost person ought to desire to die like the saved are going to die. Because I'm telling you right now, all I'm going to do is go to sleep. I'm not talking soul sleep. I'm talking about my eyes are going to close. I'm gone. Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's not a process. Okay, now, oh, five more minutes. He'll be there. No, the moment I'm absent from this body, the moment my soul and my spirit leave this, this flesh, I'm in the presence of an almighty God. Man, that's good stuff. Isaiah chapter 57, and that's why God can say it's precious. You may not say it's precious. I may not say it's precious. We should start saying that it's precious, but certainly in God's sight it is. Isaiah 57, verse number one. The righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away. Do you see what it says? From the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. I want you to notice that last part. None considering, and by the way, we don't consider it. None considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. You know what you and I ought to do when somebody's saved and they go home to be with the Lord, we ought to praise God for taking them. When I was younger, I 
I thought to myself, you know, I've never, I thought, okay, I want to get married. Okay, I want to have children. Okay, I want to do this. I want to accomplish this. I want to accomplish this. But the longer that I live, you know what I realized? I'm thankful for my wife. I promise you that, guys, I, I want to make sure you understand this. This is not a, well, he's just not happy in his home. No, I'm perfectly happy with the woman that God gave me. I'm perfectly happy to have the children, every one of the children that God's given me. I wish I could have 15 more children. I'm just so thankful for every one of the children that God has given us. Every one of them brings something different to our family, and none of them are exactly alike, and we could thank God for this child for this and this child for this. You're not listening to a guy that's disgruntled in life, but you're listening to a guy that understands that this life is not the best that I have. Does that make sense to you? I'm not complaining about what I have. I'm, I'm getting excited about what I have ahead. And I think we need to change our minds on death. I really do. Let me read you just a couple of lines of this. One of the things that, that uh, we've learned through researching hymns is the saints of God used to sing about a lot more subjects than what we sing about today. And uh, here's, a, here's just a couple of lines. This is by a man named Benjamin Bedome. I don't have time to tell you about him, but he was a Baptist preacher. I think preached over 800 sermons. And every time he'd preach a sermon, he'd write a hymn to go with his sermon. Incredible. Here's this song. And is it so that I must die ere long resign my fleeting breath? Jesus, I on thy grace rely, who hast by dying conquered death. Extract the tyrant's fatal sting, nor let a cloud obscure the day, that I on faith's expanded wing may joyful mount and soar away. Death is an entrance into life to those who are by grace prepared, a stroke that ends our mortal strife and ushers in the great reward. Leaning upon my Savior's breast, I bid adieu to every fear, while in his arms I sink to rest and leave a world of sin and care. That's the way we ought to view death. Precious, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Are you going to be like the psalmist or are you going to be like the Lord? How are you going to view death? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to be together tonight. Lord, some of the Bible is much easier to believe in our minds intellectually than it is to put it into practice. And this is one of those subjects. And Lord, I just want to say and publicly declare, shame on me for viewing death from my perspective and not taking the time to consider yours. Lord, I don't want to live my life as a Christian and die as an atheist. But I want to welcome, in your timing, I want to welcome that passageway with uplifted hands and uplifted arms and praise on this tongue. Help me to see it as precious, just as you do. And we'll be sure to thank you for it, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. For having such a hard topic to preach, my goodness. Hey, friend, you just heard tonight what very few people in American churches have heard. You've just heard it tonight. Man, what a blessing. What a blessing. Uh, I was thinking about something the whole time he was preaching and my wife leaned over and said something to me that told me she's thinking the same thing. She said, it reminds me of Brother Tarno. And uh, Brother Ed Tarno, m- m- many of you had never got a chance to meet him, but the Lord allowed me to meet Brother Tarno, uh, many years ago now, um, 
He was an Assemblies of God pastor who had retired. And uh, he was an old man. I don't mean that disrespectfully. He was an old man by the time I met him. And um, he came to Faith Baptist Church, joined the church because he was so disenfranchised with some things going on in the Assemblies of God, as you can imagine. You think what you want about me and him, but I'll say this. I learned so much about being truly led by the Spirit of God from Mr. Tarno. I learned a lot from him. Later in Mr. Tarno's life, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he did what any one of us would do, and that is try to be cured of cancer. He went to doctors, he began, began to undergo treatment. But he reached a point where he, he just said, enough's enough. Enough's enough. Sitting in his living room one day, he sitting in his recliner, he was very ill, he was, you know, he was just tired of the treatments. And I never heard him one time complain about death or the, the sickness. I, I'm sure he had his moments, but I never, I never saw him in those moments. And I said, Mr. Tarno, what can, I, what can I pray with you about specifically today? Here's what he said. He said, preacher, he always called me preacher. Preacher, I have asked God to help me show others the way a Christian ought to live. I've done my best to do that. Now I want you to pray that God will help me show Christians how Christians die. That's what he, that's what he told me. What he was saying is, let me maintain the joy. Let me, let me maintain the right focus, the right priorities. He didn't want to die like an atheist. He wanted to die like a Christian, like one of God's saints. Man, that's good. That's good. Let's stand together.